The door slammed shut, and familiar footsteps echoed from the hallway. Mia grabbed the TV remote from the coffee table and pressed the red button. The home theater screen went dark, and the woman, covering her eyes, leaned back in the chair, her well-groomed hands with impeccable manicure helplessly dropping down. The only thing missing to complete the picture was heart-wrenching moans. And they followed in a cascade as soon as those very steps approached Mrs. Davis's quarters. John, is that you? The door swung open, and the loving son rushed to his mother. Mom, what's wrong with you? Is it your heart again? Why didn't you call me? Mia rolled her eyes. Oh, sweetheart, my heart is aching, and my head is splitting. I can't even get up. I thought I wouldn't see you. I didn't call because I didn't want to bother you unnecessarily. You have plenty to do even without my ailments. The woman took a breath and plaintively asked, Son, if you don't mind, could you fetch the first aid kit? John darted to the kitchen, where various pills, ointments, and other emergency medical supplies were kept in a separate cabinet. Lately, Mia had been having more frequent attacks, so John had to fetch the first aid kit more than once. He brought a miniature suitcase and unlocked it. Mom, should I give you drops or a tablet? It's better to give drops, double dose. They act faster. There's a glass on the nightstand. There's clean water. Just drop them right there. The man took the glass from the bedside table and began to read the drops aloud. After preparing the medicinal concoction, he asked, Why didn't you call Lena? She could have given you the drops. The woman's lips stretched into a thin line, and she said disdainfully, Can you rely on her? She only thinks about herself. Seeing the despair on her son's face, the mother softened her tone slightly. Yes, and she's not home. As soon as you left for work this morning, she went somewhere too. John's eyebrows raised in surprise, but he silently handed his mother the glass. Mia took small sips of the medicine, still keeping an eye on her son. John stood in the middle of the room looking bewildered and finally asked, Where did she go? It's her day off today, isn't it? Mrs. Davis placed the empty glass back and said with undisguised irritation, And how should I know where she went? She doesn't report to me. Deal with your wife yourself. The strong nervous tension made Mia burst out of the image of a hopeless invalid. Her face turned pink and her voice rang out like a well-tuned string instrument. But such a reaction didn't surprise John as he was well acquainted with his mother's tactics. Lately, she had been in constant confrontation with his young wife, so the atmosphere in the house was tense even during rare moments of ceasefire. To avoid escalating the situation further, the man calmly stated, All right, I'll talk to Lena. And you shouldn't worry about trivial matters. At your age, stress is undesirable. Mia wanted to reproach her son for his excessive loyalty to his wife, but he briskly headed for the door. Mom, you need to drink hot tea now. And I also need to warm up. It's so gloomy outside. After a minute, Familiar sounds began to emanate from the kitchen, symbolizing domestic comfort. Mia got up easily and walked to the window. The autumn landscape evoked melancholy, and involuntarily she exclaimed, Yes, no wonder the great poet said melancholy time. I don't see any charm in it. With that romantic digression concluded, Mia was engulfed in a fit of anger mixed with a sense of dissatisfaction. Such feelings are experienced by people who have failed to achieve their goals. Mrs. Mrs. Davis had been suffering from this complex for almost seven months now. That is, since that April day when her son married that stupid provincial girl. Although his decision wasn't a surprise, Mia still hoped that John would listen to his parents' opinion and unite in marriage with Abigail, the only daughter of Austin's associate. 
but the son acted against common sense, showing by his actions that he didn't care about his mother and father. It was his marriage that became the notorious apple of discord, hindering peaceful coexistence under one roof. But Mia wasn't going to give up. Right after her son's wedding, she made a vow to herself, I will make every effort, but I will not allow this country bumpkin to ruin the life of my only son. This promise became the main guiding principle in the life of a woman accustomed to complete submission of household members. After all, even her husband, despite his high position in society, was entirely dependent on her. Austin fell into a trap when he agreed to take his wife's surname. Mia explained this requirement to him approximately like this. Austin, it's not for me to tell you that a well-known surname decides a lot. Although you are successful in business, the Miller name doesn't say much. But Mr. Davis not only sounds impressive, but also opens all doors for you. And indeed, after marrying Mia, Austin's life changed dramatically for the better. To prevent fate from playing a cruel joke on him, the man began to unquestioningly fulfill everything his wife demanded. For decades, the Devises treasured their family reputation the most. Mia's mother, Gerda Davis, was the heiress of the famous name. John's grandmother was a secretive person and did not show affection to her only grandson. In very rare moments of emotional uplift, she indulged in revelations. It was from her, not from his mother, that John learned the family history, which was carefully passed down from generation to generation. He knew that there were times when this was done in whispers and with an eye on the door. Gerda would tell with a smirk about that period. For many years, we lived in a communal apartment where seven other families also lived. But only we had two rooms, which caused envy among the neighbors. So, there was always a fear that one of them would inform the appropriate authorities about my father. After all, your great-grandfather held a high position despite the dark spots in his past. Of course, John was curious to know what those spots were, and he bombarded his grandmother with numerous accompanying questions. Gerda was inspired by such an interest in the history of their family, and she gradually lifted the veil of secrecy. Your great-grandfather even had to change his surname to hide some facts from his biography. You see... Charles was a descendant of a noble family. His ancestors owned a factory. Well, after the revolution, everything changed, and many had to save their own skins. The Devises also immigrated, but my father decided to stay in the homeland. He was very young then and believed in the new government. At this point, the grandmother laughed. I don't know how the neighbors sniffed out this fact. But we didn't take offense. Yes, and what's the use of being offended by primitive fools? So, we lived, John, waiting for changes. And they came just before the collapse of the Union. As a war and labor veteran, Father was given a separate apartment, and we got rid of the hated neighbors. It's a pity that Dad didn't enjoy it for long, he passed away two years later. And your grandfather Robert and I decided to take advantage of the favorable moment. From John's grandmother's story, he learned that the Devises quickly regained what they had lost. They started their business in the market stalls for groceries, but within 10 years, they became owners of a chain of stores. In conclusion of her story, the grandmother sadly remarked, Your grandfather and I always dreamed that our only daughter and grandchildren would never need anything. Although this wish was almost fully realized, Grandma was dissatisfied. But perhaps she was hiding something else from her grandson. In his youth, John tried to find out all the details, but Gerda once sharply rebuked him. John, don't forget whose surname you bear. In the Davis family, it's not customary to ask unnecessary questions. To put it in old-fashioned terms, it's not done. John felt uncomfortable asking his grandmother about the meaning of this word, so he had to turn to the internet for clarification. 
Since childhood, John had been taught to behave within the bounds of what was allowed. This greatly strained the active boy, who wanted to play ball in the yard with his peers and just be mischievous. But his mother constantly scolded him. John, you shouldn't associate with the riffraff from the neighborhood. Take an example from your older brother. Leon was 11 years older than John and seemed very grown up to him. His brother was studying at university and was fully immersed in the process. Therefore, he simply didn't have time to pay attention to his younger brother. Against this backdrop, Mia's advice seemed funny to John. Instead of attending music school, he secretly ran to the stadium. When this blatant violation of discipline was discovered, his mother came up with the most severe punishment for her son. John, I'm very sorry that you let down me and your dad. So now, dad will be driving you to school every day and picking you up after classes. The strict regime didn't scare the boy because he still had a way out. He could either run away or come up with an excuse to skip some lessons. In the first week, John implemented this plan twice, but was caught in the act again. That is, on the school stadium. He didn't know that his parents had asked the class teacher to report to them about all of their son's actions. On the same day, the mother and father found out about the act of disobedience. This time, Austin was in charge of educational work with the disobedient child. Son, before doing something, you need to think about your family. At that time, John was already 10 years old, and he already had a clear understanding of life values. In response to his father's reproach, he retorted, Dad, tell me, is it a crime to play with friends? I haven't done anything wrong, and my grades are all good. I don't understand what you and Mom want from me. For a moment, Austin was at a loss, but, as always, his mom came to his rescue. John, you need to carefully choose your circle of friends. Those ragamuffins you like to play ball with are not your equals. Take an example from your older brother. Usually, Leon rarely spoke up, but this time he couldn't hold back. Stop scolding the guy. Don't take away his childhood. Leon went to his room, slamming the door loudly, and the parents were bewildered for a few more minutes. The next day, closer to the evening, Leon called his younger brother, John, we need to talk. At that time, the parents were not at home. They went to their dad's friend's anniversary. So the brothers could talk calmly. Leon was a man of few words. John, I've heard many times how mom advised you to follow my example. The boy confirmed these words, well, yes. She often tells me that. The older brother looked him in the eye, and John even felt a little uncomfortable under his gaze. His words sent shivers down the boy's spine, brother, always stay true to yourself. You don't need to follow someone's example or imitate anyone. Just be yourself. John objected nervously, but mom says, Leon impatiently interrupted him. Unfortunately, parents don't always give reasonable advice. I, too, since childhood, have been fed the idea that the devices are a status I must live up to. But in reality, it's all just words, just ordinary baloney. Never before had Leon used slang words. John was even stunned by his confusion. The older brother noticed his condition. You see, little brother, you can't fit a person under a lid for life. And our parents don't want to understand that. They constantly impose their opinion, as if trying to mold you into a perfect creature. They ruined my life. I'm the unhappiest person in the world. Leon said the last phrase in a doomed voice and asked his younger brother to leave him alone. John went to his room and spent the whole evening thinking about Leon's words. Of course, he didn't understand much due to his young age. But the words of his brother about how mom and dad had spoiled his life literally imprinted themselves on his mind. These words didn't leave his head the next day either. 
and late in the evening, they were informed over the phone that something bad had happened to Leon. Nobody briefed John on the details of the tragedy, but according to the main version of the investigation, Leon was beaten up and then thrown off a bridge. In ordinary families, such sad events are experienced together, but after Leon's death, the Devises drifted further apart. Grandma Gerda, in general, stopped coming to them and secluded herself in her apartment on the outskirts of the city. She changed her bright clothes to morning attire, which she didn't take off for many years. A few days after the funeral of his son, Austin ended up in the hospital with a heart attack, but the day before, he had quarreled with his spouse, which apparently worsened his condition. The parents argued loudly, so John heard everything from the first to the last word. The father accused the mother of cruelty. Mia, it's entirely your fault. In pursuit of your own ambitions, you turned Leon's life into a living hill. But even the most powerful machine can't withstand constant overload. And a human is not a machine. Mia was outraged that her husband, who always obediently complied with her demands, dared to express his opinion. Austin, you have no moral right to say such things to me. If it weren't for me, you would still be Miller and running a shop. Mia, are you being foolish or pretending to be? You're just obsessed with your pedigree and refuse to understand that it's not the name that makes a person successful, but their actions. It's surprising to hear this from you. Perhaps you've forgotten that my mother officially runs the whole business? No, I haven't forgotten. I don't claim anything. I'm disgusted by talks about inheritance and all that nonsense. And anyway, in such a situation, conversations on this topic seem inappropriate to me. But Mia wanted to settle everything and continued to reproach her father. Your position is familiar to me. As soon as the wind blows in a different direction, you cowardly retreat. Let's clarify once and for all what's important to you and what you consider nonsense. Where did you dig up that word? To her mother's provocative attack, the father responded very calmly. Mia, your son died just a few days ago, and you're starting quarrels. Calm down and think about how we're going to live with all this. Austin, do you really want to say that I'm to blame for our son's death? His death is both yours and mine. I'm guilty of allowing such behavior with the children. But that won't happen anymore. The next moment, the door of the parents' bedroom swung open and John barely managed to move aside. But the father didn't even pay attention to him. He went into his office and locked the door. In the morning, Austin was taken to the hospital with a heart attack, and he spent almost two months there. Mia quieted down for a while. She wanted to take over the company while her husband was ill, but her grandmother forbade her from appearing in the office. Sort out your family affairs first. Her mother was offended by the remark. Mom, why are you angry with me? I just want what's best. Gerda looked at her daughter for a long time, thinking about her own matters. And when Mia began to wither under her heavy gaze, her grandmother sadly said, Mia, I would call you the destroyer. You keep trying to take over by force, but the result is always the same. You didn't save your son because of this, and now you're pushing your husband into the grave prematurely. Unlike you, Austin is decent and responsible, and I trust him completely. Only as John grew older did he realize that those words from his grandmother were a judgment for his mother. After the visit of the head of the Davis family, Mia stopped imposing her ideas on her husband and no longer nagged at him. For almost six months, Austin recovered from his heart attack. During this time, his faithful friend and companion Tom Grimes managed the company's affairs. The mystery of the older brother's death remained unsolved. Many times John tried to find out the circumstances of Leon's death from his parents and grandmother, who continued to mourn their beloved grandson. 
but his relatives brushed him off like a pesky fly. Only once did his grandmother advise. John, you'd better not poke into the hornet's nest. It's dangerous. This conversation happened shortly before his marriage. Then he realized that there were many skeletons hidden in their family closet. Despite serious health problems, Austin always kept a close eye on his company. Of course, it would have been much harder for him without the help of his faithful friend Tom Grimes. The men shared a strong military friendship, which later turned into almost brotherly relations. Tom Grimes was used to achieving everything on his own. He grew up in a family of ordinary workers and was accustomed to hard work from childhood. Having fulfilled his duty to his country, Grimes returned to the provincial town where he spent his childhood and youth. He planned to find a job with decent pay that would allow his family to live without hardship. But all attempts to find work ended in failure. The man fell into despair and saw no way out. And at this critical moment, he remembered his army comrade. Austin Miller wasn't surprised by the call from his former comrade. He joyfully shouted into the receiver, Tom, enough with the unnecessary chatter. Buy a ticket for the next train and head over to me. Grimes didn't like hasty decisions and tried to object. Austin, but I need solid guarantees. I'm not a Rothschild to travel around the country for no reason. Austin guessed that his friend didn't even have the money for the trip. Although I'm not a Rothschild either, I'm always ready to help a friend. I'll send you the money via urgent transfer right now, and you can pick it up today. And then leave immediately. Got it? Don't delay with this matter. I'm expecting you in the capital tomorrow. I hope you haven't forgotten that the orders of the platoon leader must be followed unquestionably. After the conversation with Austin, Tom immediately felt relieved. The next day, as promised, Austin greeted his friend at the capital station. After a brief exchange of friendly hugs, Austin went straight to the main agenda. Tom, let me describe the situation to you in a few words. The rest of the details will come as we go along. In short, I was lucky to get a job at a solid company. Essentially, it's a chain of stores selling all sorts of stuff. The staff is constantly expanding, and the most in-demand position at the moment is a driver. If you... They learned to understand each other with half a word in the army, and Tom joyfully interrupted. Austin, I'm in. You know I'm a driver by calling. But I'm ready to work as a stoker or a loader, just to have the opportunity to earn a stable salary. The next day after Grimes arrived, he set off on his route. He delivered goods to trading points along the route towards Washington. Austin arranged a place for his friend in the dormitory, and Tom considered himself the luckiest man. Good-naturedly teasing his friend, who had achieved greater success and held the position of sales manager in the company, Grimes said, Austin, how did you manage to pull off such a cool maneuver? Share your experience. Miller just laughed. Tom, you won't believe it, but there's no secret. Just like you, after demobilization, I actively looked for a job. I went to different organizations, but couldn't find anything suitable. And one day, in the dim corridor of some shady company, I met an ancient old man who asked me to escort him home. The old man was over 90, he told me right away. Could I refuse such a respected citizen? Anyway, I escorted him all the way to his apartment, and as soon as the door opened, everything magical began. Grimes interrupted his friend. Austin, you're quite the storyteller. Can't you make it shorter? Miller regretfully noted. I was just getting into it, and you stopped me like a galloping horse. Well, if you don't want to listen to the adventures of a former soldier in the capital, I'll tell you the main thing. This old man became the key to the magical door behind which a completely different world opens up. 
and my benefactor's name is Charles. Despite his advanced age, the old man owned several shops and trading points. He managed his whole sizable business together with his daughter and granddaughter Mia. Since Austin mentioned only Mia among the old man's granddaughters with special warmth, Tom guessed that she was the main reason for his friend's unbridled joy. In other words, Austin, you've fallen for this Mia? Tom made a funny face and sang falsetto. Mia, come out of the house. But Miller wasn't offended by his joke. He twinkled his eyes and dreamily said, Tom, you have no idea what kind of girl she is. Well, since we've broached such a sensitive topic, I'll admit that Mia and I have decided to get married. We're getting married next Saturday. Tom exclaimed with delight. Wow, so I'm stepping right into the fray, huh? Austin looked embarrassed. Well, yes, it turns out that way. I hope you won't refuse to be my witness. Of course, Tom couldn't refuse his friend such a trivial thing. To look worthy at the celebration, Tom rented a nice suit from a salon. He knew perfectly well how to behave at events of this caliber and performed not only the role of witness, but also that of the master of ceremonies excellently. The only thing Austin didn't warn his friend about was the requirement from his future wife to change the Miller surname to a more worthy one. Tom learned about this fact later when an unfamiliar signature appeared on the documents. He asked the chief accountant in surprise, Have we got a new boss? The woman asked with no less surprise, Tom, were you born today and not aware that Austin took his wife's surname? Weren't you a witness at the wedding and missed such a moment? Not good. This news was a real shock because, according to old traditions, usually the woman took her husband's surname. Austin immediately fell in Tom's eyes, and Tom didn't even hesitate to inform him about it. Austin patiently listened to him and said, You're wrong to blame me for supposedly marrying for calculation. I really love Mia, despite her strong-willed character. I'll even say more, I can't imagine anyone else beside me but her. Tom exclaimed in outrage, Austin, but taking your wife's surname, I think it's not manly. Austin, looking like a man wise with experience, replied, We're used to living by stereotypes, but most of the conventions we carefully adhere to play no role in real life. And when you love someone, you want to make them happy. You'll understand it yourself when you meet the one with whom you want to spend the rest of your life. And by the way, Charles, that old man I told you about, also changed his surname in his youth to save his life. True, he had to marry a woman he didn't love. So, don't judge people for actions you consider wrong. The friends never returned to this topic, but Tom Grimes remembered these words when he himself fell into a love trap. Diligence in work has always been highly valued. Tom hadn't been working at the Davis Company for a year when he was appointed as the garage manager. And Austin hinted that it wouldn't hurt him to get an education. Tom himself had been thinking about enrolling in correspondence courses. That same fall, he submitted documents to the Mechanical Engineering Institute. During the first session, he met Cindy, the daughter of Professor Butler. From the first moment, Tom realized that he couldn't live without this fair-haired beauty. Everything about this girl seemed perfect to him, her gray eyes, melodic voice, laughter like a bell. Cindy reciprocated his feelings, but immediately warned that her father was very strict about choosing friends. When he asked for an explanation, the girl, embarrassed, said, He's against me dating guys without a pedigree. These words embarrassed the young man, and he even wanted to take offense, but immediately changed his mind. He was afraid that a sharp response would scare away the girl he liked so much. But at the same time, Tom didn't want to agree with Cindy's father's derogatory statement. He cautiously remarked, 
Cindy, my parents are simple people, and I'm not reaching for the stars either. But I think that the main virtue of any person, regardless of their status and background, is integrity and a responsible attitude towards work, family, and friends. So, your father is wrong to categorize people like that. Unexpectedly, Cindy smiled. I think so too, and I've told my dad many times that his ambitions won't lead to anything good. I even told him that I'm not going to live by his command. Tom asked with interest, And how did you respond to your desire to be independent? The girl sighed heavily. So far, he hasn't. What if he finds out that we're dating? He knows, but he pretends not to. Overall, he's kind, but he likes to pretend to be strict to show off. He wasn't always like this. Before, Dad was cheerful, loved to organize family celebrations. My classmates envied me. They said, what a cool dad you have. What happened? Why did Professor change? The girl shyly looked away. Such things are not usually spoken about. But I feel that you are a reliable person and I can trust you. I was 15 when they divorced. Mom left Dad and went to Germany, where another man was waiting for her. She wanted me to go with her too, but I refused because I couldn't leave Dad alone. After this conversation, Tom Grimes made a final decision. He must marry this girl. He didn't hesitate for long and the next evening took a bottle of good cognac and waited for the professor outside the institute. The professor was surprised to see him. If I'm not mistaken, you're Tom? Grimes took a deep breath. Richard Butler, you're not mistaken. My name is Tom, and my surname is Grimes. I not only attend your lectures, but also date Cindy. The professor was puzzled. And what is the meaning of this unusual introduction? Tom took another deep breath and blurted out. Richard Butler, I don't come from a distinguished family, but I love your daughter and want to marry her. The professor remained silent for a long time, but mischief danced in his eyes. Then he rubbed his hands together and said slowly, Such matters, Tom, are not decided in a minute. Intuition told Grimes that now was the time for decisive action. He took out the cognac from his pocket and the professor looked at him with respect. Oh, you have good taste, young man. Of course, Tom didn't tell the bride's father that he had borrowed the cognac until payday from one of the Davis stores. They sat in some remote corner until almost midnight. They drank cognac from paper cups and nibbled on mandarin slices. They talked about different topics, but that evening Tom realized the main thing. All people, regardless of their status and wealth, experience roughly the same feelings. Professor Butler had also gone through many trials. He had experienced personal tragedy and now tried to protect his beloved daughter from any misfortunes. Tom, besides Cindy, I have no one. She is my light in the window. I won't survive if something happens to her. Richard Butler... I will do everything to make your daughter the happiest woman in the world. For a quarter of a century, Tom Grimes kept this solemn promise. Although the professor had long since passed into the next world, Grimes had no intention of breaking the vow he had once made. And he understood the father-in-law's desire to protect his daughter from any troubles when he himself became a father. John was a frequent guest in the Grimes house, but he always had strained relations with Abigail. The daughter of his father's best friend was always arrogant and tried to emphasize her superiority. Of course, John couldn't stand such behavior from an ordinary girl, and every time he tried to put Abigail in her place. Most of their meetings ended in quarrels, after which a long period of complete ignoring followed. Austin just laughed at the children's inability to find common ground. But Mia reproached her son. John, girls require special treatment, and you behave with Abigail like a hooligan. 
Since childhood, John couldn't stand injustice and objected to his mother. Why should I tolerate her arrogance? She's not a queen for me to obey. And anyway, I don't want to be friends with her, but you force me to. John was partly right because at some point in male friendship, the idea of uniting families arose among the best friends. And such a desire did not arise out of the blue. There was a favorable environment for it. After all, Tom Grimes, after graduating from college and marrying the professor's daughter, began to rise rapidly up the career ladder. In a relatively short time, Grimes reached the position of CEO of a subsidiary. Later, he invested his capital in developing his own business, which he informed his friend and partner about. Austin, don't take offense, but it's time for me to stand on my own feet. Mr. Davis supported his friend. You're right, I've been thinking about it too. And I even wanted to suggest you get into the restaurant business. Tom Grimes was amazed at the suggestion. Austin, you're reading my mind. I've been thinking about this for more than a year. You see, I don't want to aim for large establishments. I want to create something exclusive. Mr. Davis chuckled. Do you want me to guess again? Go ahead. You know, buddy. City dwellers are tired of everything. They're living the high life. Everything is at their fingertips. It's a completely different story in the provinces where even visitors have nowhere to have lunch. Of course, we have cities with developed infrastructure, but you can count them on one hand. So, there's plenty of work to do here. And it wouldn't be bad to create establishments in such settlements where dishes from farm products would be prepared. Imagine the opportunities. Grimes breathed in admiration. You've come up with a great idea about farm products. You could even base the cuisine on old recipes. Tom Grimes was charged with a new idea, and Mr. Davis even envied him. Tom was lucky. Mia had a different opinion, which she immediately voiced. What are you envying? Well, for one thing, Grimes gets fresh ideas, and I'm stuck. And this unpleasant phenomenon is observed both in business and in personal life. The woman was indignant. What or who is preventing you from getting back on track? The man waved his hand helplessly. Mia, I don't even know myself. Most likely, it's burnout. I don't have the motivation for new ventures, and I don't have the health either. Mia smiled mysteriously. But we have a son who can fix everything. Mr. Davis perked up. What are you thinking, my dear wife? As a serious conversation was imminent, Austin settled comfortably in his office chair and nodded to his wife. I'm all ears for your revelations. Mia began from afar. Austin, you know perfectly well that one event can change a life. Well, yes, I've experienced it firsthand. If I hadn't married you, who knows where I'd be now? Exactly. The main thing is to correctly interpret where the finger of fate is pointing. And marriage, as you've noticed yourself, is the most effective way to turn everything around. And what follows from this? Austin strained his brain so much that deep wrinkles appeared on his forehead. Mia playfully touched his nose. You're so forgetful. Remember, about ten years ago, you and Tom wanted to unite our families? Mr. Davis laughed. Can you seriously consider such plans? Of course, it wouldn't hurt to preserve our union, and a new direction in business would benefit the common cause. Mia eagerly picked up. Austin, if John marries Abigail, then fantastic prospects will open up. I'm sure Tom Grimes won't object to this marriage. Austin decided to remind his wife of a very important circumstance. Mia, you always try to run ahead of the locomotive and forget that in the company I'm only the second face. 
Everything is decided by my esteemed mother-in-law, and you and I don't know how she'll react to this idea. And you're not considering the main thing our son's opinion. As far as I know, he's not eager to get married. Mrs. Davis threw her husband a displeased glance. You're his father, and he should listen to your opinion. Talk to him, convince him, finally. The man agreed. Okay, Mia, I'll talk to John today. But I won't pressure him. The conversation between father and son lasted no more than five minutes. Austin didn't hide his disappointment when his son confessed that marrying Abigail Grimes wasn't part of his plans. Dad, don't embarrass yourself and don't embarrass me. It's the 21st century and you're starting some kind of incomprehensible dance with tambourines. You and mom can be upset with me as much as you want, but I'm not going to sacrifice my life for your questionable ideas. Besides, I already have a girlfriend whom I plan to marry. Austin relayed his son's response word for word to his wife. Mia listened to her husband, her mind already swirling with anxious thoughts. No, John, I'll clip your wings. You've become too bold lately. Mrs. Davis didn't confide her further plans to her husband, fearing for his health. Lately, Austin had been complaining more frequently about chest pains. She hoped to find an ally in her mother, but Gerda greeted her daughter coldly. And upon learning the purpose of her visit, she pointed her to the door. Mia, leave nicely before I beat you up. Can't you calm down already? You sent one son to the grave, now you want to get rid of the other? Mia backed toward the door and stuttered, justifying herself. Mom, what's wrong with you? I'm not doing this for myself, but for the common good. Gerda softened her tone a bit. Mia, it's time for you to calm down, don't ruin John's life. Let him marry the one he likes. Mia grabbed onto the last weighty argument like a straw. Mom, you've been drilling into my head for years that, for family life, you need to find someone equal to yourself. Aren't you aware that your grandson has decided to tie his fate to a rough country girl? Gerda sighed, but confidently answered her daughter's question. People are prone to mistakes. I admit I was wrong then. You've made plenty of mistakes too, and it's time to rethink your life. And now go, I'm very tired. Mia returned home in a bad mood. She snapped at her husband when he inquired about the progress, then began to reproach her son. The woman's dissatisfaction boiled down to the fact that she alone had to solve all the problems. And her son and husband unfairly enjoyed the fruits of her labor. John wanted to object to his mother, but his father signaled for him to stay silent. Then, when the men were alone, Austin said, The best remedy for a woman's hysteria is silence. Remember, son, this recipe, and never give in to your mother's or wife's provocations. After all, you're planning to get married? John wasn't taken aback, but said firmly, Yes, Father, Lena and I have decided everything. To avoid upsetting Mom, we'll live separately. Finding cheap rental housing today is not a problem. When Mrs. Davis learned of her son's decision, panic seized her. With tears in her eyes, she began to beg her son. John, please don't leave me and your father. Forget what I said before. After all, the most important thing for me is for you to be happy. If you love Lena, our home is open to her. John listened to his mother and couldn't believe his ears. Was his mother really saying all this? But Mia backed up her good intentions with actions. She took an active part in preparing for the wedding, choosing new furniture with the future bride. Lena didn't hide her admiration. John, you have an amazing mother. I don't feel any discomfort around her, it's like being at home. These pleasant feelings disappeared the next day after the wedding, and Lena found out what her mother-in-law's revenge tasted like. 
Mother and son were having tea in the kitchen when Lena returned. The young woman walked into the room. Oh, are you having tea? Can I join you? I'm freezing all over. John glanced at his wife. Interesting, where could you have chilled? Lena looked at her mother-in-law with surprise, then turned her gaze to her husband. Didn't Mia tell you anything? I went to the market on her request. Then I stopped by the pharmacy to get medicine for Austin. Mrs. Davis shifted uncomfortably in her chair. Well, yes, I asked Lena for a small favor, but I forgot. John pushed his cup away abruptly, spilling tea on the white tablecloth. Mom, this doesn't sound like you. You've always had a phenomenal memory. Mrs. Davis raised her voice. Why are you picking on me? So what if I forgot? It can happen to anyone. I felt unwell and everything slipped my mind. Her son looked at her attentively. Mom, I get the feeling that you're doing this on purpose. Mia protested, how dare you speak to me like that and in front of this girl. John also raised his voice. She's not just this girl, she's my lawful wife. Lena stood there with a frightened look, holding the teapot. She tried to defuse the situation awkwardly. Mia, please tell me, what have I done wrong to you? Why are you so set against me? Mrs. Davis lost control. Yes, who are you to ask me such questions? You country bumpkin. Pauper. Tears welled up in Lena's eyes. How dare you insult me? Mia shrieked, should I be ashamed in my own house? And who is telling me this? This insignificant gray mouse? John, how could you marry this foolish girl? The young man tried to remain composed, but his mother's provocative behavior pushed him over the edge. Mom, enough. I'm tired of listening to your insults towards my wife. I don't understand what you're trying to achieve. Mia, in a fit of righteous anger, blurted out, You want to know what I want? Fine, I'll tell you everything. The happiest day for me will be when you kick this girl out of our apartment. You made a fatal mistake marrying her. Abigail is cultured and educated. John yelled in wild desperation, Mom, stop it. I refuse to listen to your nonsense. If my wife bothers you so much, we'll leave together. Mrs. Davis opened her mouth to deliver another barrage of reproaches, but at that moment, Austin appeared at the doorway. The head of the family asked with a smile, What's all the noise about? What are you arguing about? John smirked. Nothing serious, Dad. Mom just has a lot on her mind. She's kicking Lena and me out, and we're fine with it. We'll move to a quieter place today because our apartment feels like a volcano about to erupt. Lena stood in the same spot, her hands pressed to her chest. John noticed her trembling. He took her hand and led her out of the room. Lena, calm down, everything will be okay. Let's pack our things and go to Grandma's. She won't refuse us shelter. And then we'll figure out what to do next. But before the young couple could disappear behind the door of their room, Mia's frantic scream rang out, John, Dad is feeling unwell. Call an ambulance. Austin's second heart attack proved fatal. John hoped that his mother would calm down after losing a loved one, but it turned out to be quite the opposite. Mia turned into a wolf, unable to forgive those around her for her emotional wounds. During the memorial meal, she publicly attacked her daughter-in-law, accusing her of her husband's death. It's you, glutton, who's to blame for everything? As soon as you appeared in our house, misfortune started pouring in. Lena, in tears, jumped up from the table and rushed to the exit of the cafe, where about 50 acquaintances and friends of the deceased had gathered. Of course, everyone sympathized with the inconsolable widow while casting judgmental looks at the bride. 
John didn't know what to do. He wanted to chase after his wife, but couldn't leave his mother in such a state. The man thought, all right, I'll figure it out later. Lynn is probably with Grandma. The news of her son-in-law's death shook Gerda. She came to the cemetery to bid farewell to Austin, but refused to attend the memorial service. So John was sure he would find his wife at his grandmother's apartment. He took his mother home, but she demanded that her son stay with her. John, is she more important to you than your own mother? The reproach pierced him straight in the heart, and the son stayed overnight at his parents' apartment. In the morning, Mia felt unwell, and he had to take care of her. He called his grandmother and heard news that plunged him into another shock. Lena left yesterday. She asked me to tell you that she doesn't blame you and isn't upset, but she's tired of playing the victim. A heavy sigh escaped him. Grandma, what should I do? A short answer followed. Your heart will tell you. Mia exerted all his efforts to influence John, but the son immediately saw through his mother's cunning plan and expressed everything to her directly. Mom, you are putting me in a difficult position. As a son, I'm obligated to help you. I'm not refusing to fulfill my duty, but I also have obligations to another woman who will become the mother of my child in a few months. In wild rage, Mia screamed. Get out. Get out of here. And never show your face here again. I don't need such a son. I'd rather turn to strangers for help. John didn't expect such a turn and tried to calm his mother, but she threw a cup at him, which she had been holding in her hands. He quietly left the apartment and headed to his grandmother's to share his feelings with her. Gerda listened to him, then said, Don't worry, your mother will calm down. Seeing that her grandson was about to object, the elderly woman smiled and remarked, I know my daughter better. She's a strong woman and a magnificent actress. But her heart is made of stone, incapable of love and compassion. And in many ways, it's my fault. John, it's time for me to tell you everything. The man guessed. You mean Leon? Yes, about him. He left this world himself, unable to endure his mother's abuse any longer. Leon was dating a girl, he wanted to marry her. But when Mia found out about these plans, she started harassing your brother's fiance. I don't know what she said to her, but the poor girl decided to leave this world, and the doctors couldn't save her. And a month later, Leon died. But before that, he left a note. After his grandmother's confession, John lost track of time. He sat in silent shock, forgetting about everything else. And one thought was pounding in his mind, she really is a she-wolf. Although, no. A she-wolf takes care of her children, but my mother thinks only of herself. He was snapped out of his stupor by the gentle touch of his grandmother's hand. John, Lena is waiting for you. Go to her, she went to her village to her aunt. Lena watched tenderly as her little son enthusiastically scattered his toys in the playpen. John tiptoed up behind her and hugged his wife. Darling, did you forget that your husband needs a hearty breakfast? The young woman laughed. No, I didn't forget. Everything's ready. Come to the kitchen. And you? I don't feel like satisfying my hunger alone. I'll be there as soon as I wash my hands. The woman walked into the bathroom and exclaimed with admiration. John, I still can't believe this is our home. It feels like I'm in a wonderful dream and I can't wake up. From the kitchen came the voice of her husband. You don't need to wake up. Let this sweet dream last forever. Lena carefully dried her hands and headed to the kitchen, which impressed with its spaciousness and rich decor. Initially, they lived in an old house that they inherited from John's mother. 
After cutting ties with their mother-in-law, the young couple decided to forge their own happiness. It was very difficult, and they often fell into despair. But one day, Gerda came to visit them and declared from the threshold, John, I thought long and hard and have come to the conclusion that only you can continue our family business. John was surprised. Grandma, but you're doing fine on your own, and you have a daughter. The elderly woman immediately replied bluntly, Mia is an unworthy heir. She nearly bankrupted us all, and I'm no longer in a condition to manage affairs. It's good that Grimes helped me out of old friendship, and I want to give you a directive. Stick with Tom personally. He was a friend of your father and a deeply honorable man. Grandma stayed with them for a couple of days, and before leaving, she said to her grandson, It's not proper for the Devises to live in such a house. John, you need to build a proper home. The places here are good, and the city is close by. Moreover, Tom has an interesting plan and wants to involve you in a new venture. This was Gerda's last wish. John's grandmother passed away quietly in her bed. But before her death, she disposed of all her property, leaving everything, including the city apartment, to her grandson. The young couple had considered returning to the city, but one evening at dinner, John said, Grandma was right, these are indeed wonderful places, and I've grown accustomed to them. Well, let's fulfill our ancestors' wishes and start building a new home. Just a year later, they were already celebrating a housewarming. By this time, their family had welcomed Leon, their firstborn, whom John named after his deceased brother. As Gerda predicted, Grimes provided substantial assistance to the young family. Tom's daughter also married a reputable businessman and moved to Europe. John lamented about it. And what do they find in Europe? I just can't understand. As if everything there is perfect and everyone's rushing there. That's how it is. You raise children, and one fine day they say to you, goodbye, and forget where they came from. John was grateful to his father's friend not only for his help, but also for never mentioning their past plans to marry him off to Abigail. Even during his father's lifetime, Grimes had branched off from the Davis Company and created a network of restaurants and eateries catering to rural populations. When Tom Grimes suggested merging the two companies to John, he immediately agreed. To be honest, I was waiting for you to propose this to me. But I was too embarrassed to ask. There are many farms in our area facing problems with selling their produce. I think entrepreneurs would appreciate the opportunities that cooperation with us will open up for them. Indeed, from the very beginning, the business showed positive results. Local residents eagerly visited the farm food establishments. They often heard positive reviews about their business. They should give a medal to whoever came up with this. Now there's no need to bother cooking at home. We can go dine at the restaurant. And it's also a cultural outing. Of course, this path wasn't without its challenges. Sometimes, local authorities opposed, expressing concerns like, Why open another pub? So people can drink even more? In such cases, Grimes wisely pointed out, Then you should close the stores too, so people lead a sober life. But a similar experiment has been done recently, and you know perfectly well where it led. No one could come up with a strong counter-argument to this, and the businessmen were given the green light. And when substantial financial contributions began to flow into local budgets, officials themselves started asking for an expansion of services. All right, here's the translation. Two years flew by amidst business affairs and family worries. On the morning when the spouses had breakfast together, nothing foreshadowed change. John thanked his wife for the treats she constantly spoiled him with, standing higher on the front steps of their new home. 
He hadn't descended the steps when Grimes' SUV pulled up to the house. Mr. Davis was surprised. Why was he here? Didn't we agree on something? Everything further made the young entrepreneur forget what he had agreed upon with his senior partner. First, Grimes jumped out of the car. The man circled his SUV, opened the rear door of the salon, and helped a passenger out of the car. John was speechless when he recognized his mother as the visitor. He rushed to her. Mom, did you decide to visit us? Mia raised her chin. No, son, you guessed wrong. I decided to move in with you permanently. I am not at the age to lead a solitary existence anymore. And what's the point of my suffering if I have a son who is obliged to take care of his mother? John felt short of breath. He gave Tom an expressive look, but he just shrugged. On the porch, Lena was standing in confusion. Her face expressed a mix of different feelings. But, as a decent hostess, she approached her mother-in-law. Hello, Mia. Come inside. You must be hungry from the road, I suppose. But apparently, the mother-in-law considered the ordinary gesture of politeness as the daughter-in-law's desire to please her in everything. Mrs. Davis proudly marched into the house, not even turning to her son, who was bending under the weight of her two suitcases. She once again cast a contemptuous glance at her daughter-in-law. I hope there will be a separate room for me in the house. Lena nodded in agreement. Guests are always welcome in our home, but allow me, as the mistress of this house, to decide where and who will live. We have barely settled here ourselves, and we weren't expecting guests. Mia flashed her eyes. Are you saying I'm not needed here? Understand it as you wish, but you won't be in charge here. If you've forgotten my name, let me remind you that my name is Lena. It's unknown how this quarrel would have ended, but at the most critical moment, the cry of little Leon was heard. Lena rushed into the living room, repeating on the go. Son, mommy's already coming. What happened there, my dear? John released the suitcases from his hands, and they crashed loudly on the ceramic tiles in the hallway. He ran past his mother, exclaiming, Lena, how many times have I asked you not to leave the child alone? Mia stood in bewilderment. She didn't know what to do. Grimes approached her closer and whispered, Go, take a look at your grandson. Such a lively lad is growing up. He's already trying to misbehave. Mia cautiously walked into the room where the young spouses were busy with their child. The baby was wriggling, trying to break free from his mother's strong embrace. John anxiously asked his wife, Are you sure he swallowed the wheel from the toy car, or do you just think so? Lena exclaimed, John, I don't know, but the car had all its wheels. How did he manage to peel it off? I don't know. The young woman, almost in tears, asked the little boy. Leon, give mommy the wheel back. Please. The boy suddenly laughed, showing off his teeth. Mia went to the playpen and picked up the wheel from the toy car from the floor. Are you looking for this detail? The young parents turned around suddenly. Lena grabbed the unfortunate wheel. Thank you, Mia. Let me introduce you. This is your grandson. Mrs. Davis looked at the boy, who unexpectedly joyfully reached out his little hands to her. For a moment, she was at a loss, then she carefully took the child in her arms. The unmistakable scent hit her nose, familiar to every woman. Mia pressed her grandson to her chest and whispered, Leon. He looks so much like Leon, dear God. The baby was happily babbling and looking at his grandmother while she was crying and asking God for forgiveness. John and Lena watched this touching scene, not knowing what to do next. And again, Grimes helped. The devices. I see I'm extra here. 
so I'll leave you until evening. If you don't mind, Cindy and I will come to visit you in the evening. My wife has long dreamed of meeting you, Mia. Mrs. Davis responded inappropriately. Yes, yes, of course. We'll definitely talk in the evening. Mia had never felt such happiness as when she first held her grandson in her arms. Her heart fluttered and beat in a completely different rhythm. And she realized that she didn't want to let go of this warm bundle. She was choked with excitement, finding it difficult to breathe. She looked at her daughter-in-law with a plea. Lena, please don't send me away. I'm willing to live on the veranda, just don't deprive me of the opportunity to be with my grandson. Oh God, he looks so much like our Leon. John hugged his mother. Mom, I named our son after my older brother. And you can be with your grandson as much as you want. He looked at his mother and didn't recognize her. The pretense of grandeur had fallen away, and now he was being looked at with familiar and very warm eyes. He felt a sting in his eyes and leaned against his mother's shoulder. Mom, everything will be all right with us.